Good morning and welcome back to the Flow Track Podcast. My name is Lincoln Shrike, joined today by Gordon Mack. It's Monday, July 27th. You can email this podcast, flowtrackpodcast at gmail.com. Let us know your thoughts. Are we going to have a cross-country season? Is Gordon going to uh, still have rankings to do this season? So many questions still up in the air. And Gordon, we don't have any clarity after the NCAA had a big fancy meeting last week. I uh, thought maybe there would be an announcement on if there's going to be fall sports. And as you said, they punted on the decision. What was your reaction to the NCAA delaying their uh, their decision for later down the road? Uh, if you think about it, it really shows that the Power 5 football committees have a lot of sway because right before the Board of Governors meeting on Friday, there was a letter sent to the Board of Governors saying, Take your time. Think about it more. Sit on it. So that's what they did. They literally sat on it. Uh, I think a lot of the people who are most involved in this are the ACC commissioner, the SEC commissioner, you know, all these big power five commissioners, and they want to have sports. And they knew if the NCAA in July said no Olympic sport championships NCAA style, that's what I'm, you know what I meant to say. If they if they if they canceled it in July, it's gonna be it's gonna make the Power Five football conferences look bad if they keep going. So basically, they're mm. trying to not look bad because you know I think what's gonna happen is I think that's what's gonna happen. I think the NCAA is gonna move everything from D two D three FCS all Olympic sports. They're all gonna be postponed slash or canceled. But Power Five is gonna be like, well, we don't have to follow that. And it's also, and like, I think they're going to try to move along. I think they'll try to say like, hey, what we're doing is instead of there being 3,000 student athletes, there's now only 700 or whatever, whatever. Like, we'll say a, a school, instead of a school having 300 fall student athletes, they only have 80 fall student athletes. Look at us. We made, we, we reduced the risk by 66%. Right, so that's what they'll try to pitch, uh, but we'll see. That's what I think happened, yeah. though. I think it was the football committee people saying, "Hey, punt until further notice." It's appropriate, no pun intended there, or maybe you did intend the punt pun. Um, I remember a week or so ago, you had you were kind of wondering aloud if how much say the NCAA or control they have over FBS football. And I've done some reading on it, and it does seem like the FBS is a little more uh, autonomous, obviously, than the rest of NCAA sports. And we know they have tremendous financial, you know, motivations. I think, uh, or I did see, Wisconsin AD Barry Alvarez says if there's no football for Wisconsin, the school is set to lose $100 million or something like that. It's just absolutely nuts. So I think your... Uh, your suspicions are probably accurate that it's they're still trying to figure out the football thing and uh until they have that all sorted out they don't want to make an announcement for the other sports they want to come in with some negative news with some positive news right it's like uh, no olympic sports in 2020 fall but we are going to have every Power Five conference, every FBS school competing in football. So when they didn't have the football thing figured out, you have to imagine that they were like, "Let's just wait," because we're not just going to say we don't. We haven't figured out football, but we do know that every other fall sport is canceled for the fall. Like that's just all bad news, right? Um, yeah. Has your I don't want to say opinion, but belief that there's not there is or there isn't going to be a cross-country season has it changed via coaches you've talked to or just as late as we are in the game nearing august like are you now on in the camp that thinking there's not going to be a cross-country season or where are you, where do you fall right now in there well i always was in the camp that the only thing that's gonna the reason i was in a cross-country season is going to happen because i was in the camp that football is going to happen and i just said one goes with the other. If football happens, cross country happens. If football doesn't happen, cross country doesn't happen. But now, understanding that those two things can be separate and that the NCAA can kind of cancel cross country, but the NCAA can't cancel football, I am more on the side of 
cross country is going to either be postponed or canceled. And mm-hmm. the only reason I say canceled is because every other sport can be postponed except for cross country because obviously we have indoor and outdoor. Um, I mean, I would love for us to have a crazy spring cross country season or wild winter cross country season, but uh, I'm now moving on the side that cross country won't happen in the fall all because it can now be separated from FBS football. Mm -hmm. But before I thought, but now I I realize it can Right, and it's because the FBS kind of rules itself, and and NCAA has nowhere near the amount of say as they do over uh, cross country soccer, all those other sports that we yeah. that we uh, call the the Olympic sports. Um, I will say one thing that maybe not as encouraging and and uh, unrelated specifically to the NCAA, but an outbreak by the Miami Marlins baseball organization is going on right now, which is not a good look for the leagues and the sports that are not bubbled like the NBA. The NBA has basically got no cases at this point because they're in this controlled environment. But a sport going on right now, major sport, baseball, not doing that. Of course, they're taking precautions, but they're not controlling where people go to the near the level of obviously the NBA, which is, of course, a mold, a model for what would be done in NCAA sports. Well, they're having this big breakout right now in the Miami Marlins, and they had to cancel their game tonight against the Orioles. That's a situation you can't avoid if you're student athletes. And uh, I think that's going to dictate not just, I mean, I think they were considering, strongly considering canceling fall sports before anything happened with the Miami Marlins. But that's a situation you don't want to have as a PR crisis at, at best and, and a really serious health risk at worst that you can't avoid. And uh, maybe they can control it with college football because there's so much money involved. But the other sports, they just can't put the resources in uh, to bubble the athletes. And uh, I don't know, not not a good sign when so many things are breaking out, regardless of where you fall, of how dangerous this this virus is. I mean, it, 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 it's obviously killed 150,000 people, but it's just uh, there's no interest, I think, from the athletes and the coaches to put themselves in in that risk. I mean, some people are going to be different, different opinions, want to run cross country regardless of the risk. But, you know, pushing the sport back is interesting. I think we've heard some rumors and I'm not reporting this but you know pushing cross country back to the spring like what would that even look like because athletes are used to running track and you also have the top level distance athletes who would want to compete at the olympic trials are they really going to be running a cross country season while also preparing to run in the summer the the olympic trials it it pose you know it, it poses a ton of logistical ish uh you know roadblocks and issues that would be very interesting as from as opposed to having no cross country season, I would love to have a, a March, April, May cross country season, but I, I'm curious how it could possibly work out. I mean, if you think about it, the the best athletes in the US all ran cross country in February and it was fine for them, right? I mean, we had USA Cross mm-hmm. in February and that didn't really screw up any of the the top elite distance runners for USA's down the road in summer. So I mean, yeah. the only negative is like it's gonna you can't have February cross country if you live in, if you're in the Northeast or New England area, right? You're only going to really have February cross country if you're in Florida, Texas, the Northwest, yeah. California. So uh, that's a factor. I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of different thoughts, right? Cancel it, do it during indoors, do it during the spring, this, that, the other thing. In the end, it's all who knows, right? We're all just kind of. Uh, projecting potential ideas against throwing throwing ideas against the wall to see what, what sticks. Uh, I think mm-hmm. though we're just waiting for that first uh, ball to drop to confirm that it's not happening in the fall. But until then, yeah. we're all just going to be having the same type of podcasts every day. Be like, all right, cross country is now happening <laughs> in March. Nope, no, it's February. Okay, now we're, no, we're moving to May. All right, no, it's back yeah. to November. Okay, no, what we're doing, we're doing it all in August. You know, I don't know. It's just so much uncertainty. Yeah. Um, did any track happen yeah. this weekend? Yeah, we did have we did have some track. I th- I felt like I was gonna say something else about crap, but we'll just we'll just leave it at where it's at. I I I'm tired of you got to the rest of 2020 to talk about it. Yeah. <laughs> I guess so. Uh, yeah, we did have some track. Continues with these small 
meets put together and the sprint the sprinters are in florida and texas scattered some places internationally and then we had some distance action but we'll start with the sprinters trayvon bromel we were excited when he ran 1004 now he ran 99 beat noah lyles and is now getting to the point where it's like trayvon bromel is fully back like if there was an olympic games this year if there was an olympic trials obviously we're already past that date but Pretty good shot this guy makes the team. I mean, he is like 26 I think it's beyond 20, that now. 2015. Yeah, I think it is too. Um he's he's seems like he's back to his 2015 form when he's in 2016 when he's running the nine eights and won a world indoor 60 meter title. Uh did this surprise you at all? Yes, it did. Uh, but it also didn't. I mean, I I, I remember debating with a, a fellow colleague what the 1004 meant, and I meant yo, 1004. That means he's like he's back, and they were like, "Nah, man, you gotta run sub ten. That doesn't matter. You got." And I was like, "No, you don't understand. Like, ten oh four season opener against this competition is like a legitimate sign that he is back to the elite level." And mm -hmm. then this happened, and then I followed up to that text, like, "See what I mean?" And he's like, "All right, now I believe." Uh, but nine ninety flat against Noah Lyles, so it's not against like some local junior college competition. You're going up against. Who people probably thought was a medal contender, right? No allows. I mean, oh, of course. He didn't. He he didn't run the hundred in twenty nineteen, but we assumed he was going to do it in twenty twenty. Uh, yeah. I mean, who who's better than him right now, right? Okay, is well, Christian Michael Coleman Norman. better than him? Is Christian Coleman better than him? No, because he's probably not no. going to be there. Right, because he won't be not there in twenty twenty. He's not going to be. Not, yeah. Well, in twenty twenty one, most likely he won't. Right. We're assuming okay. that. I'm I'm assuming that Christian Coleman gets gets banned. If that Oof. doesn't happen, Coleman is still the best. But if he does get banned, he's not going to be there. Michael Norman's mm -hmm. not going to be there. He's running the 400. Yeah. I mean, Justin Gatlin just lost to Ronnie Baker, so Gatlin's kind of like there. He just beat Noah Lyles. Who else is there to beat? Right. Yeah. He's just like he's the yeah. best now in the world. Wow. How he is. How uh, how things have turned. Um. Yes, I would say there is something to be said about how he is so eager to get in shape because he has been hurt for so long and other people may be truly treating this as as a down year. I look at at Gatlin. Lyles is, you know, he's a little inconsistent in the hundred, but I would still nine times out of ten, I think I would pick him. Maybe I'm wrong on that. I mean, he he hasn't run faster in the hundred, but I don't know. He just last few years has been so good. I know the hundred is not his strongest event, but but still, yet he you know he's beaten Christian Coleman. He's been he's run nineteen fifty in the two. Uh, that said, let me just clear that out. Uh, nine nine is not a fluke, and this guy has been fantastic before. Is he the best hundred meter runner in the world right now? If Coleman's not there. He's close, right? I mean, if the Olympics who, started who tomorrow, him? I I would still have Lyles above him. I think okay. I I think I think there's a difference between Noah Lyles and Claremont versus Noah Lyles in Monaco and Noah Lyles at a championship. Yeah, I I don't know what it is um, exactly, and you know he may have just gotten soundly beat. That that said, he got his butt whooped here. I mean, he he didn't break ten seconds, and and obviously. Uh, Bromel ran nine nine, so he he got soundly beat. And it's not like they're running in separate heats too. They ran two lanes apart. Um, but yeah, he's he, 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 he he's up break there 10 now. Seconds for the record, I think Late. he ran nine nine seven. Yeah, are you, in the heat, are you sure? he ran nine nine seven. Yeah, I gotta I'm pretty. Confident. I gotta check. Hold on. He came it. back. He came back and ran nine ninety three. Wind aided in the final. He ran nine ninety seven. Didn't he run nine ninety seven? Hold on. No, I ran ten. We're looking it up. That was that oh, was Degrasse. Ran... Degrasse ran yeah. nine ninety seven. Oh, okay, okay, sorry. So Degrasse, another, you know, I think he, he was the bronze medalist in twenty nineteen in the in the hundred. So like, there's another medalist. If Gatlin's not there, he's the silver medalist. And if Coleman's not there, he's the gold medalist. So he's beaten the guys who were silver and bronze. <laughs> and Coleman is uh, maybe probably who knows not going to be there. So 
is there a is there a good argument for Coleman being the best hundred meter runner in the world right now? Or excuse me, for Bramel being the best hundred meter runner in the world right now? Yes. Um, it's just it's You're it's, still it's, with it's so it's experience. It's so legacy. jarring. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I would still put Lyles, but but it's just so jarring to even to consider it. This guy was basically done, and I know yeah. we've 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 hashed this out. We've talked about this. You interviewed him, but wow. It, it, this is a incredible, incredible comeback. And all of a sudden he's zoomed up and he's like back to his old level. Uh, I don't know how he's done it. It's incredible. It is incredible. Uh, I was making a joke and internally. I was like, after you're on title four, or like he's back. But after nine, nine, you're like, no, he's not back anymore. He's just here. He's present. Like it, mm, yeah. he is yeah, yeah. forever. Like now, like going to be in the conversation for the next four years. Uh, beat Noah Lyles. Yeah. I mean, it's cool. I mean, maybe we'll see something special from him in 2021, 2022. I mean, he's still young, right? We forget oh, about yeah, that. 25, he went pro yeah. at like he went pro at like age 19 or 20. So, uh, yeah, I was impressed. What? What? I mean, I was also kind of impressed that Ronnie Baker ran 10 flat. I mean, that kind of get, got swept on. I kind of went under the radar. He ran 10 flat, and he beat Justin Gatlin. And I'd say that for the same reason when Bromel ran his 10.04, you're kind of like, okay, you need to run that low 10 to kind of show that you're back in it. And Baker mm -hmm. had been missing for a long time. Uh, he you know, he ran like 10.2 last year. Uh, got like six at USA's, but he's been dealing with injuries. But remember, I mean, during Coleman's run at the 60, Baker, who was running in phenomenal times, just happened to be right behind world record pace times. So... Ronnie Baker now showing that he is getting back into form. I mean, he's not as a big of a name, a flashy name like a Bromel or a Lyles or a Coleman, but or Gatlin. Yeah. But I think Baker's ten flat shows that he's also ready to be in the conversation for a top three spot. Uh, I'll admit I missed Ron wild. Ronnie. Yeah, I'll, I missed Ronnie Baker's performance. What meet was this at? There was, I think he ran it at the AP Ranch meet, okay. part two. Can't find. I've been I've been struggling to find results for that one. Like I said in my in my recap of this weekend's action, it was like finding results is like you have to stalk social media and like be an internet sleuth to to even yeah. uncover this because I I tried to find some AP Ranch results stuff that wasn't tweeted out and it's kind of tough to do. So, uh, but props to him. I mean, we know Baker is good though, right? He's run in the like six forty. I'm pretty sure in the sixty, he's silver medalist there. Uh, he beat Coleman in 2018. Had a, maybe beaten him a couple times. I know Coleman was kind of injured that year, but yeah, this is a guy that's very, very special. And the hundred, like we we talked about earlier, but it's crazy how it could totally take a completely new form in 2021 in an Olympic year. If Coleman's not there, if Gatlin's over the hill, if Bramel stays back, we could have a team of Bramel, Lyles, and Baker in some order, and that would be a totally different group from a U.S. team that got the top two spots at Worlds in 2019. That's that's nuts. Yeah. And uh, at that meet that uh, Baker ran his um, 10 flat, Shikari Richardson, I think, ran 10, sub 1080. Yeah, 1079 so plus 2.7, I think. 2.7 probably converts to still a sub, sub 11 mark oh, yeah. when, when legal. Uh, that's another person who I kind of was kind of on the fence about. She had an incredible NCAA run once 1075 mm -hmm. in Texas. And you're like, whoa. And then she just like put up dud after dud after dud after that performance. Right. Remember she went to yeah. pre put up a dud, didn't do well at USA's. And you're kind of like, was that just a flash in the pan? And she never going to be able to get that back. But I think the fact that a year later, she's able to put up a, a reputable mark or even a great mark in that I think it shows that she has been able to kind of come off that freshman season high and that her post-college summer wasn't really indic ind indicative of mm -hmm. what she can become. And I think that's also a good sign for her because uh, she's young. She's what, 19, 20, 20, 21 or something like that? 20. 20. So – that's a good sign for her. And the U.S. women in the 100, we haven't been able recently to crack the Jamaicans, to crack the Coast Ivory Coast athletes. Uh, we've been kind of been third fiddle in the in the 100 world. Um, I mean, Tori Bowie was 
running well back, but that feels like so long ago now. What she was like mm. dominant what in 2017. So mm-hmm. maybe Shikari can lead the new new wave of athletes to try to start competing again against the Shelly and Fraser Pices, the you know, the Ivory Coast duo, you know, see what they can do. I think it was clear to most people that she was totally burnt out after NCAAs last year, getting last in the in the US final, I think pulling at not making the two hundred final. She peaked completely at NCAAs, and it re- she was rewarded, I imagine, with a hefty contract after that 1075. Uh, but the talent doesn't go away. Uh, 1079, even if it's a little wind-dated, is, is spectacular time. And just the separation she got early. She's a huge, huge talent. And, you know, we've discussed this on the show before, but even if she never runs 1075 again, she can still be very, very successful. But I expect her to be making teams. Uh, the U.S. in the women's 100, is still, it's not a strength, right? I mean, there are some names, some people, but you know, you got English Gardner who seems to always be hurt. Tiana Daniels was solid last year, made the world final, but she hasn't run any times that are going to light the world on fire. Uh, you mentioned Bowie; she seems to be over the hill. Uh, Moralake Kennison, good, not great. So there's room for Shakari Richardson to take over the U.S. 100 on the women's side, and she certainly has the talent to do that, and I think that showed this weekend. She hadn't broken 11 seconds when legal. She still hasn't, but you know, I think we can convert this since that 1075. So uh, she's rounding back into form, and if she gets in a European meets this year, I know it's tough to for Americans to travel to Europe, but it is possible. I really want to see her. I would love to see her against uh, Shelly Ann Frazier Price, against Elaine Thompson, against you know the two from the, from the Ivory Coast, like you mentioned. Um, she's, I think, she's ready to go and to to test herself again. And and uh, I think this was a good in between year for her. Maybe the Olympics would have been Olympic trials would have come up a little too fast, but now she has kind of a a gap year, like we like we would call it, to where she really gets to understand what it means to be a sprinter and uh, improve her craft, improve her mentality. So uh, I expect greatness from her. And uh, I think she learned the lesson from from flaming out at USA's last year. Also at, I'm not sure what meet this was at. I think it was the Florida one. Yeah, Shawnee Miller Uwebo runs 1098 and 2198 double. Yeah. The 2198 makes sense. She's a great 200 meter runner. Uh, mm-hmm. I was really wasn't that like oh wow I mean it's it's a very fast time but like okay fast person runs fast time makes sense mm-hmm. the 1098 though made me really think about this because last week we had another 400 meter runner run 986 now 986 is a little bit better than 1098 comparatively in the all time ranks of that specific gender's uh, 100 meter descending order list but still 1098 is an elite like you are. Pretend you have a shot to make a world final type time. Uh, what is your reaction to now a second 400 meter runner running mm-hmm. an elite 100 meter time where they don't train in that event? Yes, they train mm-hmm. in the 200, they train in the 400, and 200 is kind of close to the 100, but they are not doing like six, they're not doing like start like 60s type stuff and yeah. starts. They're focused on strength, the 400, they're running repeat 300s, they're doing. The 200 stuff. What's your results of a person just being like, I can dom these two athletes who are like, yeah, I know you guys spend all your time, your life's work, focus on this hundred. I can just show up and be just as good as you with zero hundred meter training. Well, I do think it's one of the few advantages of this COVID season where you get athletes trying events that maybe they wouldn't have time for, would never run on the Diamond League or international circuit. So you do have that advantage for Miller Weibo because she hadn't really run the 100 since 2017, wasn't particularly good at it. 11-17, I think, was her personal best. Yeah, this was super impressive. Because of Usain Bolt's success as a tall sprinter in the 100, we tend to forget that it's really hard to be a good 100-meter runner when you're a tall athlete, and that's exactly what Shawnee Miller Weibo was. And to be sure, you watch her start for this hundred meters is not that good. Her drive phase is pretty poor, um, but still yet to have the leg speed to to run ten ninety eight. And I know we can get a little bogged down by context of where people rank and blah 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 the IAAF scoring tables and whatnot. 
But if you do go off those IAAF scoring tables, which John Mulkeen of World Athletics does, uh, this ranks Shawnee Miller Weibo as the fourth best all around sprinter across the 100, 200, and 400 meter of all time behind Marta Koch of Germany, Flojo, number two, and then of course, Marion Jones, who probably shouldn't be on that list. Um, you can make the argument for some other athletes there. there. No, she is. She's fifth. So Shawnee Miller Weibo leapfrogs. Allison Felix, as far as the combined point totals for the three sprinting events on the women's side, Allison Felix's PRs in the 100 and 200 are faster, but given Miller Weibo's 48 37 PR, she is uh, she is above Allison Felix. So it, it was a big moment for for Miller Weibo going from 11 17 down to 10 98. We've known she's had range. I, I wouldn't say the performance surprised me, but just the raw speed, because again, like I said, not really a great starter. Um, for her to have that speed, though, is is quite impressive as a as a taller athlete. And yeah, I mean, by any measurement, we've known this though. By but by, by by any measurement, now with her hundred being a respectable time, she's one of the greatest female sprinters of all time as far as range goes. Not not quite decorated yet, or as decorated as her peers up there. You know she's won a gold medal though, and uh, but she has plenty more to to come clearly, and this was a, a sign of her of her greatness. Not to be uh, negative, Nancy, but do you uh -oh. think the success of non hundred meter runners in the hundred meters kind of ruins the hundred in a way? Be like, wait, so we're not seeing the truly fastest athletes compete over this distance we're just seeing some of the fastest athletes compete over this distance do you know what i mean no i don't like, let me explain that a little bit further well, so like if if uh if a, someone like a michael norman or shawnee miller weibo can run at this level yet when mm -hmm. we have national championships or world championships of the 100 meters they're not going to be involved so are we truly mm -hmm. finding the fastest human on earth who can run a hundred meters in a certain time, or we're just finding well, the fastest hundred meter runner who happens to choose that event. You know, it's just like, you know, do you know what I'm trying to say? Like, it's just like, I mean, you're weird seeing like healthy, potentially faster hundred meter runners not compete in an event. Yeah. It's like, what are well, we doing? Let's be clear on the women's side. I mean, 1098 is never going to win you a gold medal. No. So it's not like Agreed. we're like seeing somebody that's like uh, is somehow we taking away credibility from the 100 because she doesn't compete in it. And people that are worse than her are meddling because she's not there. I think now you can make that argument certainly with Norman in the 100 and most definitely in the 200. I mean, the men's 200 internationally, I think we would all be pretty confident saying that Michael Norman would. would be a silver medalist and perhaps some more if he ran in the, in the 200. Um, but I don't know in the hundred in the hundred worldwide. I mean, if, if Coleman's there, we clearly know who the best is. He's the best in the world. There's not a, in another event, there's not a better hundred meter runner. And on the women's side, I think the same is true. I think Shelly Ann Frazier price is the best hundred meter runner in the world. And just because some other people can run sub 11 doesn't change that. So I don't, I don't view it yeah. that way. That said, you can make that criticism for a lot of other events in track and field. You know, you could look at the steeplechase and be like, there may be better steeplers that are running the 1500 just because it's an odd distance. So certainly the criticism or th that type of outlook can be applied to other events, maybe some distance events. Uh, but but I don't think the 100 meters is, is one of them. Yeah, but like I'm just saying, like, imagine if like it, 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 it just it makes you think like that the shouldn't the people who focus 100 percent on certain event be better than the people who focus 10 percent to zero percent on that event well it's tough to be as good as michael norman and it's tough to be as good as shawnee miller weibo it shows that they could be those two athletes are one of the, some of the few athletes that could focus on and literally they they norman and miller weibo could focus <clears throat> on their third best event and still be professional athletes you're not going to professional track and field athletes with shots to medal. You're not going to find many of those. Those few are <clears throat> rare among, among athletes. Most athletes. I guess it's like a Deion Sanders. 
Yeah. And most athletes have yeah. one. I mean, they're like a two sport athlete within track and field like that. It is super rare. They're the Bo Jacksons. They're the, like you said, the Dion's uh, you, most Tebow. athletes are not that. Yeah. Well, okay. Uh, <laughs> you can't apply that negative. You can't look at them and, and say it reflects badly on the athletes who are specialists because it, it, it's so rare to have that, that ability. And I mean, who knows, you know, maybe Miller Weibo over three rounds in the hundred is, gets weeded out. These are one-off races, right? It, it, things are trickier when you get into the rounds and uh, they know themselves. And there's a reason they don't run the hundred, even though they could be good at it. It's because they have strengths other where, elsewhere. And they also know that, you know, Shani Miller Weibo knows she can't beat. Uh, wow. I just blanked on her. Shelly and Fraser Price, like. That's why she runs the 400. So it yeah. doesn't weaken the event in, in, in my eyes or, or make the other athletes who can't do this look bad. I mean, we're, we're seeing in the praises of Trayvon Bromel running 990. He came back the next day <clears throat> and didn't break 21 seconds for 200 meters. So, you know, we're talking about him maybe being the best 100 meter runner in the world right now. And apparently he's right now stinks at the 200. So like, there's no shame in not being Michael Norman or Shawnee miller Weibo. Yeah, Bromel had a funny tweet about his uh, 200 performance. Uh, mm -hmm. Let's see if I can find it. Yeah, he said, uh, whoever created the 200-meter race, I got some people looking for you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's a much more technical event, I think, you know, learning to come off the curve. He probably hasn't done a lot of those, clearly. Uh, so he can laugh about it after running 990, I think. But yeah, 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 yeah. Still some improvement. We forget, though. I mean, he n never, it wasn't something he was known for. And it's not something he's competed uh, internationally. But he was good in the 200. You know, he got second at US or uh, second at NCAAs back in 2015 to DeGrasse, who's a 200-meter guy. So he can figure out the 200 as well. I imagine he's a 100-meter runner going forward full time. But he can get that distance figured out, too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's uh, wild man it is it's crazy and we should while we were talking about Bramel upsetting Lyles Lyles still had a pretty good weekend he came back and won the final in the 100 and then ran 1994 a little bit off his uh his 1890 PR in the 200 but you know he'll take the 1994 here's a question does it count as a loss if you lose in a prelim I mean, most people would say no, but this is a different season. We have athletes pulling out of the final because, I mean, what's the point of running the final after you run 9-9? Nine, nine? I mean, maybe, you know, it would have been fun, but at the same time, Bromel's, uh, Bromel's time would not have been win legal. So, you know, was, I guess it was good in that sense. But uh, I'm going to count it as a loss. I'm going to say Bromel beat Lyles, and we'll remember it. I wrote it in my article, so it, it, it counts in my mind. But, you know, who knows? We, we say we don't know the full count, thing. right? Well, so here's the thing. We count. could we could also say Lyles knew he was going to run the final, and so he truly treated it like a prelim, right? That's something. I, I mean, I, I have in that in the ticker here, Bromel beats Lyles, but it was also a prelim of a junk. Not I don't want to insult it, but you know, a nothing meet. And he's running yeah. he's running Monaco in a few weeks, so he's like, this is literally the back to the track Claremont. I'm like, why would I care about that? I'm running I'm running a ten flat to get to through to the finals of this of this meet you run you know uh so or i don't want to necessarily get, or did he get know. beat and he and he had to be like oh now i got to run the final to make it look like i didn't try in the prelim mm. that's that's a good point wow okay. uh my mind is officially blown there you, you never know with track and field and you know due, due to covid we have no there's no media on the ground really we just we don't really know what's going on so uh Tough to know. Tough to know. You you know you can find yourselves on both sides of that argument. You can say Noah Lyles got beat, or you can say he wasn't trying because he knew he was going to run the final of the one and the two. So it's tough to say. It's tough to say, but Trayvon Bromel comes out looking good either way. So mm -hmm. anything else happen in track and field that's not sprinting? Right. Nice segue. Uh there was another team boss mile. They moved from Colorado to Indiana, ostensibly to run at sea level. Uh, ran pretty good times. On the women's side, Corey McGee, 421, Danny Jones, 423, and Emma Coburn, 423. Uh, I, I'll admit I was impressed with these times. 
Corey McGee, that's eighth best U.S. outdoor mile uh, on the women's side in history. Of course, not a ton of outdoor miles, but 421, a really solid time. She's a she's an athlete that it's easy to forget about in the 1500 in the shadow, of course, of, well, Houlihan, Jenny Simpson, Kate Grace, Sinclair Johnson, Nikki Hiltz. Uh, I mean, you name it, there's, there's a, tons of athletes there. But uh, still a very, very good runner. And like I said, this time was was surprising and impressive to me. It converts to about a 402 for a 1500, mm-hmm. or 421. Yeah, 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 which would be a PR for her. Um, finished really, really well. I watched it on the USATF Facebook page. Finished really well and, and was in was behind Coburn and then to kind of took advantage of the fact that she did none of the leading, that is McGee, and really you know did a slingshot around, around her teammates. So... What it means in in a season as this, I'm not really sure. She's run well in these kind of like small boutique mile races before in the last few years, hasn't been able to translate it to success at USA's, but it's a, it's a, it's a nice PR for her. Cut off close to six seconds from her outdoor best, uh, and I mentioned where it puts her in the U.S. all time. So it's a really nice race and weekend for Corey McGee. Yeah, I was surprised. I, I mean, Emma got third. I mean, Danny Jones beat Emma Coburn. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I mean, Emma's a great miler. I mean, we see her run some good fifteen hundred like indoor miles during the yes during the winter season. So it's not like Emma's like oh the oh you're you're, you're com- coming down to fifty because most great three k steeplers are great fifteen hundred meter runners. So I was also impressed with what Danny Jones did, getting second, beating Emma Coburn. Danny Jones still unsponsored, right? Still has yet to announce her sponsorship. Yeah, right? no, uh, nope, none, nothing yet. No. Man, you got feel for the people like Danny Jones and like Oliver Hoare and all these great like graduating seniors who just like in any other year they would be having being money in their pocket right now. Like they would have signed on the dotted line in you know in June and they would been pulling in their first paycheck. And they don't get mm-hmm. to do it. it. Sucks. I will say uh, for both Joe Klecker and Oliver Hoare, they both in the last week have signed with Flynn Sports, the uh, track and field agency. And on both tweets from Flynn Sports account, they say new sponsor announcing st- soon. Stay tuned. That was for Klecker. And then for Hoare, sponsor announcement coming soon. Stay tuned. So maybe they're just being optimistic. They're putting good energy out into the world. Or you can believe that they have deals in place and they're just waiting to to make an announcement so things are not everything is lost but as of now is it is it just still nia akins that is that is signed from the 2020 class of ncaa athletes i think that's correct i think so there might be someone else out there that we don't know about but Mm -hmm. it's wild if 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 there was a if there was a a, like a pool a, a pool or a gambling pool out in fall of last year like who would be the first collegiate athlete to have a contract and also be the only one with that contract for a whole month before someone else gets one mm-hmm. or multiple months and what what was the money line on picking nia, nia akins yeah it was, well certainly lower than danny jones right um yeah. you know it, there's also you know people are pitting brands against each other they probably have offers out there and they're just you know waiting to make sure it's the the best one if if Klecker and Hoare are about to sign with a sponsorship deal, you can be sure that Jones is as well. To be honest, I'm pretty surprised, given that she trains with Emma Coburn, New Balance, Corey McGee, New Balance, that there hasn't been a deal yet for her to go to New Balance. But we don't know the economics of it. We don't know where, if the budget is there for New Balance, for Nike, for Adidas, or what have you. So uh, definitely you can say COVID has certainly slowed the money available for these athletes because, yeah, we would used to... We, you know, we'd have 10 to 20 athletes signed by this point in a normal year, if not more. So, uh, but I, I expect those to be coming in the next couple of weeks. Yeah. And it, I would think, I mean, we might have talked about this in a previous pod. Do you think any of these companies, when they're feeling hit with less people buying their product because of COVID or whatever, that they're going to just start sponsoring less athletes and be like, hey, we need a, everyone else is doing a, a budget cut. The uh, athlete, sponsorship dollars we need a cut by 30 percent and so 30 percent of athletes with the sponsorship are not going to have one in 2021 you think something like that will happen yeah 
I, I, and I, I think, I, I think I read, I think it was a Jonathan Galt story on let's run talking about how many contracts are up. were set to be, you know, there's, they were ended at the Olympic year, which was supposed to obviously be this year. And so there's going to be a tough road ahead for athletes that are trying to get re-signed off of this basically dud of a year. Um, and you know, some athletes will have not competed as much and maybe we're not in the same shape. So it could be ugly for the, the professional running economy or whatever you want to call it. Uh, once contracts end on December 31st of 2020, I, I don't, I'm not looking forward to seeing how many people are all of a sudden without a job, without, without a, a paycheck because of what the, you know, how this affected brands, let alone the, you know, the, the, the NCAA to professional athletes may not be the ones we should be worried about. It should be like these professional athletes that we would assume were kind of set with their contracts going into 2021 with this an Olympic year, but may end up getting dropped just by the pure, the, the pure, uh, financial aspect of, of things and where budget cuts need to need to be created. So it's, and, and while it's the, 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 I was just gonna say the full ugliness of the scene has not reared its head yet. We haven't seen that. I think we got to wait till the end of the year to figure out we're going to see people in droves being cut loose from their contracts. Yeah. And you think about the, the butterfly effect of that. I think that's one, the right phrase butterfly effect. Is sure. that like, yes, there's going to be some people who can, still go unsponsored and keep training and get through an unsponsored year and then maybe earn a sponsorship back. But there's going to be a lot of potential like talent that will just cut their losses and be like, all right, looks like I'm just my professional athlete career isn't happening because of this mm -hmm. moment. But maybe there was like people who decided to hang it up that shouldn't hang it up and actually could have became, you know, great athletes in 2024 that we just will never know because they weren't given the chance in 2021 to get paid, you know? So it's like, I mean, you'll never be able to prove it, right? You'll never be able to prove that this athlete who retired at the end of 2020 because of COVID would have gone on to be an, an Olympic mm -hmm. great in 2024. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, there is probably going to be one. There's going to be at least one person who retires because of yeah, COVID of who would have been great. We'll never know who it is, but yeah. it's just kind of, it's kind of right. sad, right? You know, and I, mean, I would say that that type of situation happens all the time, but it's going to be exacerbated right by this COVID yeah. situation and athletes that are going to be getting dropped or not having their contracts renewed because of the the pandemic and the financial strain it's put on companies. Um, I would like, like to think, think this. that the great I was just going to say I'd like to think the great athletes, the athletes who are got a potential medal shot, that won't happen to them. But you know, we saw Leo Manzano and he was picked up, but we, he got dropped after he won a silver medal. I think this situation is obviously going to be way worse than just your typical end of contract thing. It's going to be happening to a lot. Of, I think we're going to be uh, unpleasantly surprised at some athletes that are facing not having a paycheck. But what were you going to like, say? I, I, like, I don't. I mean, I don't know Trayvon's contract situation, but there was probably a good chance his contract probably was end of this year, right? Because he probably signed it before the Olympics. So he signed it in what 2015. So he probably mm -hmm. had a contract that went through at least 2020, maybe. If Trayvon doesn't have these two marks, Trayvon might have been left for dead sponsorship. No, no one. If Trayvon doesn't have what he's been doing, and he just kept on going and like stayed like kind of let COVID be a reason to not race as much, no one would have signed Trayvon. But now he's like the one of the best in the world. So he went from like could have been like. Uh, oh, no, yeah, you were only good like four years ago. Sorry, we're not going to invest in someone like you anymore. To now being mm -hmm. like, there's going to be people competing for him probably. I bet you mm -hmm. Nike and Adidas are going to be like, hey, we, we're, we're, we, we'll we really go up against what New Balance is willing to offer. You know? Yeah, yeah we'll see. I, I don't know how many years he got. I it feel it, It's always seemed like Bromel, and, and this is an unfortunate thing, not knowing – you know, track contracts for the most part never being publicized. It's always seemed like he was in a fine position even through this year. But I, I, I could be wrong. I mean, he survived. It, it, you're probably right. In all likelihood, it, it went through 2020, starting from 2015. So it probably was a five-year contract. Um, but we don't know that to be sure. I mean, some athletes receive longer contracts. And, you know, he... It was. I had the understanding that he got a really, really nice contract coming out of coming out of Baylor when he left after his sophomore year. 
Um, so it may have been for six years, seven years. We don't we don't really know. But at the same time, it's also a very good possibility, maybe even, even a better possibility that he could have been dry. If he would have been injured again this year, his contract may have been over. So we see now he may be, you're right, in that position where he can shop a little bit and brands are coming after him. And uh, I, I imagine he would really want to uh, reward New Balance by by staying with them, uh, not reward them, but thank them for sticking by his side after so many years of struggle. So I, I could see him doing that, but that that's all speculation. Um, but yeah, we don't want to ever take for granted be, just because this isn't publicized that some athletes are out there right now, even at this a, these AP ranch events, they're out there fighting for their contracts still yet, and they need to run fast. It's not everybody who's like LaShawn Merritt and could jog a 300 and uh you know that'd be like called a season or whatever uh it's much more the population of track athletes is is are people right now thinking about what am i going to do when the calendar hits 2021 yeah it would be so great if all track contracts were public and we just knew how much Listen, everyone I, made how for how long and then like it just i think it would i think it would grow the sport i think people would be more interested Mm -hmm. Do you know how often I'm on like early bird sport, rights and and sport, sport track, track and, yeah. and over yeah. the cap to keep track of the Eagles, Phillies and and Sixers contracts? I understand. All the yeah, time. I think but the speaking difference of the is it's not sponsorship. It's, you know, it's different. Yeah, it's but, paid by the yeah. club. Right. Uh, the Phillies game tonight has been canceled as a precaution. I know. I saw. COVID. I saw. Yeah. So things are getting ugly already in the MLB after three or four games. Uh, what I was gonna say, yeah, it is obviously to the. It's a brand thing, so they don't. They, you know, they don't have any obligation to publish that. I also think it would be embarrassing for some athletes. You know, for every Christian Coleman contract, you have an athlete who is basically getting gear plus twenty five thousand. That would be a little embarrassing, I, I think, uh, for for some athletes. It shouldn't, we shouldn't shame people, but when you compare the money of what a professional basketball player, even a fringe G League type of guy, gets to to an athlete that is just trying to make a US final, uh, it's it's a way different world, right? Um, so I think that's, that's part of the thing too. We need to like expose that that we need to like expose that embarrassment because I think when people are when people try to like you know it's the you know who's that guy uh he's like here in my garage you know what I'm talking about he's like a life advice guy who pretends he's like super wealthy I, I don't know yeah I, I feel, don't know his name yeah I feel like yeah. if if when athletes want to pretend that they are like LeBron James level of like luxury it makes the fans think that that's what the athletes are being given. And then the fans mm. then have this expectation of the, like, why is our sport, uh, why is our sport struggling? They should be given all this money. And it's like, well, they're not. So maybe the, the fans would be more understanding of like the reality of the sport. If they were able to see, we are not the NBA. We are not the NFL. We are not major league baseball. And we can like, you know, people say like, will complain about the amount of money that is given in like prize money by World Athletics or USATF. But then they'll be like, oh, it's not a lot because there's not a lot of money in the sport, right? And I yeah. think that would help people kind of understand that like in order for our athletes, for our C-level athletes to all be making $50,000, it's going to, it's, we're so far away from that, right? We're so far mm -hmm. away from, and in or, you need to kind of open it up in the doors and we need to be like, okay, oh, wow. Only, and also it would like make it a lot more sense of like, I think the biggest one, one of the, my, my, is like, there's a lot of like, a lot of times like, gr uh, they give out grants to people who make like, you like USATF always says we gave out this much money to all these people and the money they give to is the people who make top three every time the people who make top three are the ones who that's always an, get the money that makes what? sense though right that makes, makes sense. sense you're it, giving money yeah 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 it makes sense I'm not saying it's wrong but like yeah that and then but then people complain about why is the tenth person not having any money it's like because if they're gonna give it to they have to, they're gonna give it to anybody they're gonna give it to the top three and there's there's what 40 events right men and women 20 each event whatever i don't know like 36 events 
there's yeah. not a lot of money to go around. And I just, I just wish it would, they would open up the gates, show what everyone is making. And then I think people will, cause we just in our brain think all sports are equal. Like, Oh, they're the best in the world at running. That's the same thing as being best in the world at basketball. So clearly they're paid like basketball, you know, but that's just not what happens, right? Who? So we just need people to understand that. No, no prize money and no, you know, Diamond League bonuses or anything like that. Who do you think right now is the highest paid track and field athlete in the world? Contract? Like sponsorship? Con contract wise. Yeah. Just you only know. shoe. Shoe contract. Just. Just only your brand deal with Nike, Adidas, Puma, or whatever. Who do you think is getting the most from their sponsor right now? Do you think? Do you think it's Coleman? Do you think it's Lyles? What? Do, do, I mean, I I have no idea. It's crazy that we spend so much time in the sport. I mean, I could make a guess that it'd be the fastest hundred meter runner in the world. That no, I don't think it's Coleman. I don't think it's Coleman. Yeah, I would say it's. I mean, I would put someone like Kipchoge. Or Kipchoge yeah. somewhere in there. I think they yeah. have Mo Farah, I could see. Yeah. Because like the Brit like he's like he's like the LeBron James in Britain, you know what I mean? Like Well, a football like, a soccer player is the, the LeBron James. He won like but, yeah, didn't, yeah. but didn't he win like man of the year or something like that? Athlete of the sure. year? I mean he is Sir Mo. Like that. Maybe that's right. Sir but, Mo, yeah. yeah. I'd say Mo. Okay, maybe I'll just take away the international aspect because Internationally, they look at track differently than Americans look at track. I'd say yeah, of yeah, Americans, yeah. I would say this is just a guess. Cindy McLaughlin. Yeah, that's, that's what I would say. It's a pretty good guess. Her marketability is obviously significant, uh, even relative to to Coleman and Lyles. I I feel like that's a pretty solid guess. Um, I I would put. Well, here's the thing, because Lyle signed his contract coming out of high school, and he was good, but he was nowhere near this level. Yeah, McLaugh McLaughlin signed a contract, and she was, you know, not as Star. good, but I mean, at this level, at was it was it was it was already a medalist on that level, was an Olympian at 16. So I think yeah. safely, you could probably say she's the highest paid. Now the question becomes, and we're just we're just ending this with a bunch of speculation. We have no idea. Um, and the <laughs> only way I model this, the only way I model this is off of what. The one one of the few contracts that was publicized, DeGrasse's contract in 2015, didn't he get like four years, eleven million, or something like that? Yeah, so it was crazy. It was, okay, it was a lot. So, yeah. how much do you think somebody like McLaughlin is making on a contract? How much do you think she makes per year, just shoe sponsor's salary? Five million? I don't know. I don't know. I don't well, know. I don't know either. I don't know. It's crazy. We don't know, but we have no idea. We have no idea. Yeah, maybe mm -hmm. four. Four or five million. It's fair. We could put this out to the know. out to the out to the world. Uh, how much do we think athletes are I do are think making? though, I feel like a I think a lot of distance runners aren't making millions. Like I I, mm. I don't think I don't think Shelby Houlihan is making a million dollars a year. Oh, probably not. No. No. I mean I think but, Galen Rupp probably is, but I don't even think Galen Rupp's making a million dollars. Well, he's definitely made a bunch of money throughout his career, as far as I a think track Galen, athlete goes. I think Galen probably makes this is this is just guessing like two hundred to no, three hundred thousand dollars. Way more, way more, sure, certainly way more. There's no way he's a two-time medalist. No, no, he's already a what a three-time Olympian. No, he's he makes more than two hundred fifty k. I guarantee you. Uh, I would be stunned if it's. I, I imagine it's right at about a million, eight fifty to a million. I could be wrong, I, uh, but I would be surprised if it's if it's that little. That's not very much money for someone who's a, as accomplished as he is. But this, all this underscores how little we know about contracts. Literally, <laughs> DeGrasse's the fact that DeGrasse's terms were public were published. Um, that sets that that like that's where I base anything off of. It's like, well, McLaughlin was better than DeGrasse. And it's five years in the future, so she should be getting two or three, you know, a million and a half to, you know, a million more than he was. But we have no idea, right? These don't become public. It'd be nice. I, it, we're living in a dream world, though, if we think that these will ever, things will ever change. Um, and the reason we're in the public track and field is because, league. yeah, go ahead. Yeah. 
yeah, the reason why they're not public is if they were public, then uh, people would make more money. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because God the reason because because uh, you know because there's no advantage for Nike to tell people how much they're paying other athletes because then they'd be like, wait, I'm better than him. You should give me as much as him or her, you know. And then they're yeah. like, oh crap, now we have to give more money because everyone knows how much it each wouldn't. other make. It would kill. You would think. I mean, you are locked into a contract, but it and and athletes have nowhere near the power of say like uh, a, a football player that demands. You know that that sits out, right? Or you know, it's not. You're not going to yeah. have a Le'Veon Bell situation Bell, where yeah. where an athlete's like, I'm sitting out the Olympics until I get a pay pay upgrade. Nike's just going to be like, Cool. Well, we saved that three hundred thousand, I guess, because they're not competing. Uh, they don't even care if you know if you're a gold medalist. So you don't have that leverage power, and certainly you would lose that. And 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 the brands have a tremendous interest to not have that public, because if you find out that X athlete who is not as good as you on the track makes more than you, then you, and you're the same sp- brand, and you're the same uh, under the same sponsorship or under the same brand. That's not a good look. So they obviously have tremendous incentive to keep those private. And that's why we'll never see those because Nike runs the sport. So, and other brands, you know, to a smaller degree do as well. So, all right. Uh, that will uh, do it for us on a Monday morning. I think it's Kevin and Gordon back with you tomorrow. Uh, but until then, we will see you.